bond energy changes in an endothermic and exothermic reaction. So we need to draw this, we need to make a graph, all right? We need to make a graph to see what this stuff looks like. So if I was to draw a graph on each of these, first of all, which one do you think is endothermic and which one do you think is exothermic? Which do you think is endo and which do you think is exo? Left or right? We think endo or exo. Which do you think is which? Definitely the left is endothermic. Yeah. Definitely the left is endothermic because Robbie said so. Right, yeah, right, so. Yeah, Everybody concurs with that? Yeah. Farah, what do you think? So this is exothermic over here? No, I think the one on the right is exothermic. Why? Because um, when you would subtract the number of products and the number of those reactants, it would be negative. All right, so, so tell me what you're saying. So if I put a random number here, like 100, what are you saying this number would be? Greater than 100. So like 200? Two all right, 200. So 100 minus 200 is a negative 100. Ah, okay. So if I was solving this on a test, that'd be pretty easy to do. All right, so what does that look like graphically? What would I look like? I'd come up. All right, exothermic. I don't know why it does that. Exothermic. All right, now, what is this, what is this area called right here? Up and down from the starting point. You all know it. I'm patient. <laughs> you are well trained. Give myself a high five. All right, activation energy. All right, activation energy. How much energy does it take for the reaction to start is the hump, all right? Now, if I was to draw this one over here, what would it look like? So I start right here, what's gonna happen? All right, what do we got? This is endo. What about my activation energy here? Is it more or less? All right, a lot more activation energy. All right, if I was to put numbers to this, let's say that this was 50, and what would this be? One. <laughs> Yeah. Negative Well, that doesn't mean it's endothermic. Switch the So, 50, as I go up, all of a sudden now this number is going to be 1? Let me ask you a question to the original thing that we did here. All right, the original thing we did right here. All right, does it make sense that our graph would start at 100 and end at 200? Graph started right here, 100. Oh. This is 200. Oh. oh. That's what you told me. Uh, Laura. 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 Laura.
Everybody agrees, reactants minus products. Everybody agrees on that? Right? On the slide before, is that what it says? Is that what it says? Yes. Reactants minus the products. So, on this one, where are my products? And where are my reactants? What's this? Product. What's this area? Product. Product. This is my reactant. All right? So if my reactant started off, let's just do this very simply. What? Go ahead, question. What do you think? What do you think? What's that? What does it, what makes more sense? Let's go ahead and put some numbers with it right now. All right, here we go. What would I put here if you're looking at this graph? 100. What would I put here? Zero. One. All right. So reactants minus products. 100 minus zero. So it is endothermal. So we did just take the wrong notes. Oh. What do you think? That's all I care. What do you think? I think I want you to use your wonderful technology to look up an exothermic graph. Tell me what you got. What? Who's doing what wrong? Everyone. Like, everyone. I don't think we're actually doing okay. it. Okay, I think you did the zero minus the one hundred. Well, what does it say on the slide before, Tim? It says you do the um, one hundred and fifty. Um, yeah, minus, what does it say? Bond energy is minus the product. Bond energy. What? On the slide. What? Yeah, it's minus frustrating. Okay, no, see that is exothermic. We got it right the first time. Are you kidding me? Right side is exo. Okay. We got it. So, we got it, people. so tell me how this works with numbers then. Okay, no, I got this. Okay, you got this. What's so up? the right side is exothermic because um, in an exothermic reaction, you have a negative result because you're putting out energy, correct? So you need the reactants, which is the starting point, to be higher on the side of the graph than the Product molecules in the oh no I'm referring to the diagram, not the graph. Um, so like because the flow of is this diagram, different? Is it the same? I'm sorry, is this different than this? No, not not really. Okay. Um, so because the graph is like you start a reactant, you go up to atoms, and then you go back down to product molecules. You're going lower, so your end, you know, the difference between your starting point and your ending point. Is oh, so we need to add something here, is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, and then what? And then you go to zero. So like, I mean, yeah, it doesn't really make a difference, but I'm just, that's my way of thinking through. I understand what you're thinking through, all right? So then it would be zero, all right? So what's happening from, this is why I did this, is what's happening from here to here? What is happening? What are you doing at that point? What is happening? The reaction. Physically, what is happening? It is doing what? Releasing. It's releasing 150, I'll just say kilojoules, of energy. So mathematically, it may not be a negative number, but you should know that 150 down to zero is releasing 150. That's why I did that. Okay? So on the top, how can I do this? I started here. Here's my activation energy. Let's just say that this is 150 again, up top. Let's make this 100, all right? You started at 50, you added 100, and you went down to 50. 
So how much energy is being absorbed? What's the answer? How much is being absorbed? All right, I add 151 in. Oops. Went in. That's the green line here. Or excuse me, 100. Right? 100 went in. And how much were you, how much were you left with? What's the difference here? How much is left in the system? Right, the energy never got released. You absorbed an extra 50 for this reaction to go. Right? It's a good discussion. It's good. Yeah, we're going to do some actual energy graphs, so you'll get it. But it's a good discussion for today. Hopefully some of you got it. If not, next time. Okay. Now take a look. We have a nice little chart here for you, reactants products, uh, reactants and products. So if you didn't look ahead, you probably already had the answer. That was fine. Okay. All right. Example of electron density buildup. For a nonpolar nobel bond. Could somebody give an example of what elements you think, what atoms you think the top could be? Elements out there. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Very good. All right. So these heat signature maps um, we're in your book, similar to this. You have hydrogen, hydrogen, starting to come together, pull a little bit, all right? And it's gonna show the equal distribution. You got a red band here where the bond is. Bond gets less, 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 less. All right, for a non-polar covalent bond, you should have even distribution of red on red, blue should be on the opposite sides. All right, electron density distribution for a polar covalent. Where are the electrons? Where just so we know, what does the blue mean? What is in the blue? Yeah, but what is in there? What does the red mean? More electrons. More electrons are closer where the red is. The electron density is higher. Red, higher density. No matter what chart you do, population, um, growth rate, red means a higher density. Blue means a lesser density. So when you're looking at those pictures in your book, you should know that the blue means that it was electrons were deficient there. There's no electrons over here. The electron density is shifted this way. All right, that's what that means. So red is where the electrons are. So in the previous slide, where were all the electrons? The one right above it on your nose. Where were all the electrons? Right in the middle. Makes sense, that's where the bond is. Yeah. All right, so this, polar covalent unequal sharing of electrons, you can see that the HF molecule has the fluorine atom taking most of the electron density. Here it is, electron density, red. All right, hydrogen atoms with less electron density, um, has less electron density, therefore it's a smaller and drawn in blue. It is considered to be a polar molecule with a net dipole and partial positive negative charges indicated by the arrow. Not a problem, you can do that. Uh, polar bonds have dipole moments, we've already gone over this. Uh, dipole moments are symbolized by partial positive and negative charges. The arrow must always be in the direction of the most electronegative atom. We did this, you already have notes on it, it's already a video on it. A quantitative measure of dipole polar, measure of the polarity of a bond is, in, um, is its dipole moment. Good. All right. Overall final polarity of the molecule. If you determine that the bonds within a molecule are polar, this means the bonds have a dipole moment. At this point, you need to determine if the overall final geometry of the molecule gives a polar or nonpolar molecule. The shape, you can have molecular polarity, and you could have, um, may, it could be nonpolar by electronegativity. You have to determine which is which. We'll have to go in we have all these wonderful examples. In general, molecules that consist of three or more atoms are generally polar unless the following conditions are met. This is great because part C on a test question is, is it polar or not polar? Is its molecular geometry for D, 
is molecular geometry making it, is the molecule nonpolar or polar? You gotta know, you gotta know the difference. If the central atom has no lone pairs and is surrounded by atoms of one element, then the molecule is nonpolar. I would definitely be rocking that out as well. All right, on your little molecular um, chart, the one I gave you that you need to memorize, it'd probably be a good idea to know what's polar and not polar. Just saying. Unless the lone pairs are placed on opposite one another so that they can cancel themselves out, if this is true, then the final polarity will be considered nonpolar. Very rare that you're gonna have something like this. That is not how that exists. Water does not exist that way. Polar or nonpolar? Polar. All right, if it was drawn the other way, if it was capable of being drawn the other way, which is not, it would be nonpolar. That's what that's saying, okay? All right, now, uh, dipole moments of some polar molecules. Um, just giving you mathematical amounts. Um, you do not have to have these memorized, you don't have to know them, but some examples for your chart. All right, NH3 pyramidal, SO2 bent, water bent, H2S bent. All right, bond moments and resultant dipole moments. So if I look at ammonia, which is what is always used, <coughs> ammonia, methane, sulfur dioxide, sulfur trioxide, um, water, most common ones used on AP. You'll probably have two or three more, but those are, oh, XEF4, xenon tetrafluoride, always used. Something with boron, BF3, always used. All right, so if we take a look at this resultant dipole moment, all right, so we're looking at nitrogen di uh, ammonia. So what we're saying is we're drawing all of our arrows towards this. All right, from this, if you were to add up the three pushes plus the electron, you have a resultant dipole moment of 1.46. You never have to calculate that. Don't have to calculate that. You have to know where the overall dipole moment is. If they're all pushing towards the middle and it has a lone pair, remember, things are gonna be attracted to that. The overall dipole moment is gonna be up and away. All right, same with this case. Well, fluorine is more electronegative. So we're going towards fluorine three times. All right, and it's still going towards its lone pair once. The overall dipole is gonna to be towards the fluorine. The overall dipole. If you took physics, you probably understand it's similar to, I think, vectors, right? All right, similar to that. You don't have to calculate it. You just have to kind of know, well, if I got a fluorine on something, my dipole is gonna go towards that. If I don't have a fluorine, I'm gonna, and my central atom is more electronegative, I'm gonna go towards the central atom. That's it, all right? Result in dipole very rarely on AP exam. Behavior of polar molecules, all right. Obviously, all polar molecules have a positive and negative end. So, positive and negative end. All the negatives are gonna be attracted to positives. All right, they're gonna create little types of hydrogen bonds. All of these that I'm circling could be hydrogen bonds. They're not technically bonding, but they're attracted to the positive and negative charge of each other. Those are hydrogen bonds. Those bonds are your strongest intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bonds are your strongest intermolecular forces. Thank you for your attention today. I know we're rolling, but we gotta get through some stuff. I'm nervous now, I'll see you guys for a while. Okay, um, now, what's that? Okay. Uh, arrangement. In addition, I gave you more examples. All right? If the other chart is not good, use the next couple pages of charts. Number of electron pairs two, three, 
Here we go, four, five, six, whatever you want to use. Here are examples. Tetrahedral, methane, ammonium, phosphorus uh, pentachloride for a trigonal bipyramidal, trigonal bipyramidal, all right? Use those, use those. Let's go over a couple of them. We have some practice ones to do, all right? Um, I'm gonna stop there. Yeah.